Hi listeners, thanks again for joining for another episode in my Elevate series with your host, me, Becky. In this podcast, we talk about all things women empowerment, challenges in the recruitment industry, career progression, and anything else that is empowering women in business. Thanks for listening, and please remember to follow and subscribe for all updates. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, Welcome back to another episode of my Elevate series. Today, I will be speaking with Emily Kaysen. Um, We will be discussing how to use imposter syndrome to your advantage. Emily is a senior lead in the product space and has worked in a variety of different industries. She is originally from Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, where she went to university and studied product development and innovation before taking a master's in engineering management at DTU. She spent time in management consulting and a number of different fields before moving into the startup world where she has worn a lot of different hats and helped scale businesses internationally. Thanks so much for joining me, Emily. Really looking forward to today's episode. Um, Obviously, imposter syndrome is uh, quite a big topic, and I think many people have you know, face the challenges in that space. So today we're going to, yeah, discuss that. So thanks for being here. Looking forward to today's conversation. Let's start out by discussing, you know, what is imposter syndrome? What does it mean to you? And how how do you experience this? Cool. Yeah, let's start there. Thanks for having me, Becky. I look forward to this. So yeah, imposter syndrome, right? It has a really, really negative uh, con- connotation. And of course, it comes with a lot of the uh, lot of downsides. I think for me personally, um, imposter syndrome is uh, is that feeling of not belonging, being in in a situation at, at particular work, of course, where where I'm afraid of being outed as a as a fraud. At some at some point, people will point at me and be like, "What are you doing here? Why are you even in this uh, in this setting?" And not the least. Uh, the inability to uh, to recognize uh, my own successes throughout sort of career study whatever it is and not being able to 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 really identify the areas where where I've done something good or done something well and sort of elevate myself through that um, and and that is sort of also the definition of uh, of imposter syndrome and it's you know not really that uncommon um, I think we've talked a lot about it for like women but you know, it covers both men and women. Uh, maybe we've just talked a little bit more about it as women. I don't know, but it's it's definitely something that's been researched a lot from a from a female perspective. But I've actually seen some stats from Medical News Today in 2020 that up to like 82% of people experience experience it at uh, at some point. Um, not necessarily all the time, but uh, but but throughout their uh, their career. Um, and I think if we talk about sort of careers and career development, we often get promoted into something that's, you know, just outside of our abilities. The point is to kind of, you know, be able to do 60 to 80 percent of a role that we get elevated into and then learn the rest. But that also, you know, makes us uh, feel like sometimes we're in, in a situation where, you know, can we really do this? Do I really have the abilities to do this? And then and then you can really get hit by by that in the uh, imposter syndrome. I think I came across it uh, in an article from my coach that I uh, that I was working with. Um, you know, we we're talking a lot about how I felt in specific situations where I was sitting in, sitting at work, and and at some point she's like, "I think you need to read this article." And I read this article about uh, imposter syndrome, and I just remember seeing the the image that came along with the article, which was this. Um, this picture of a of a large chicken uh, sitting around the table with the, with a lot of other people in suits, and I was like, "Oh right, that's how I actually feel sometimes, right? I can just see myself sitting there in that costume and being like, "When are people going to realize that I don't fit in here? That this is completely wrong?" So yeah, that was that was really how I uh, recognized that, that is that is what I suffer from to, in some situations, and of course it's not all the time, but I do definitely have those uh, have those feelings. Yeah, absolutely. I think they're definitely things that people will uh, resonate with. Um, and yeah, I think the picture is funny, but it's it's probably quite a good visual, right, um, on how it kind of really feels. So, you know, if we just touch on, um, so we've kind of discussed what is imposter syndrome and, and kind of how you experience it. What, what are some of the downsides and, you know, how can it be uh, problematic? Yep. Yeah, so uh, so it it can actually become really paralyzing, right? If if you uh, 
if you have these feelings of not being able to recognize your own six senses um, and, you know, you kind of always have to work harder or better so you can end up suffering from workaholism, right? Where you just work way, way too much um, and you still can't, you know, recognize the fact that you might be doing really well. Um, but the other part of it could be that you just end up doing nothing and try to not go for those things that you really want in your career. So, so that's, uh, that's really problematic, I think, for sort of the, your own development. If you actually want to do something, you can't really go for it. I think there's also this whole, you have to ask other people for acknowledgement. Um, you know, you're not able to build yourself up. Um, so you kind of always have to go to other people or look for them to acknowledge you, uh, which I think can be really hard for your self-esteem um, over time. And also, you know, can, can end up in a situation where you don't contribute uh, in certain situations because you're you're afraid that your input isn't valued or it doesn't have any have any weight so so you end up you know not negotiating for the race that you know you, you might actually uh, uh, be entitled to but you're like no maybe maybe not or you know I, I I don't know how to put into words why I should have this this race you might not go for promotion uh, again, because you need others to recognize your achievement and tell you what they are. So you're like, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not good enough for for that job or for that promotion, and I, you know, I can't ask for it because, you know, I haven't done anything to warrant it, which is obviously often not true. And then, uh, you know, you might hold back and not bring all of you and all of your ideas to the table. Um, and, you know, that's one thing is that's not good for you, but it's also not good for whatever company you're working for if you're not actually bringing all of you because you're there for a reason, right? You're there because you contribute, because you have something to offer. But if you convince yourself that you don't, um, well, then then you don't actually bring everything with you to that uh, to that table. And I think that's that's a that's a big loss. Um, so I think it, it needs to be combined with a certain amount of courage and risk appetite, right, to, to really balance out that uh, those, uh, those negative effects, um, because otherwise it will just, it will just stall you. Uh, but I think if, if, uh, if you do couple it with, with some risk appetite and some courage, then I think there are really awesome, some upsides. Yeah, exactly. So kind of going into that then, as you mentioned, there's a, a good kind of balance to be struck, right? So yeah, what what are the upsides? What how could you harness these feelings or these thoughts in a positive way? I think there's definitely some uh, some some ways to do that. I think the uh, before I talked a little bit about the downside could be sort of a workaholism without it, you know, really turning into anything. But but the opposite side of that is that you you know you you're really driven. You really want to do better. You really want to do more. You really want to um, seek out more uh, information um, to be able to contribute more, right? So in that sense, suddenly suddenly it's a driver for you to show even more of who you are and what you can do. Um, I think for me specifically, I I uh, prepare a lot. So like a detailed preparation. So like to make sure nobody can call me out for not knowing something specific. Um, so really have that sort of cover cover all your bases. So that's sort of one side of it. But I think another side of it has to do with how you work with people. So, you know, I, I see a lot of people becoming more team player oriented. And definitely goes for me. And so, you know, I seek input and I go for democratic decision making, try to make sure everybody's on board because I don't come in with a, you know, oh, uh, you know, I'm right. I know this I kind of, you know, always challenge myself internally. So I invite other people into that process. And, uh, and you know, I think that helps other people come on board and, and you're seen more as a, as, a, as a team player. So you kind of go go above and beyond and you build your competence, uh, you build knowledge, and then back to sort of that whole interpersonal communication, right? You you want to involve people um, and you really, you know, you, you go to people to to ask them to be part of something. So I think that's some, you know, really important upsides that, that actually come with the whole imposter syndrome, in, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right. If you are experiencing imposter syndrome, it, it could be a good sign, uh, not always, but it could mean that you're in a, a state of potential improvement or being pushed out of your comfort zone, meaning somebody has you know, asked you to be in that situation or you've managed to get yourself into whatever the scenario might be. 
might be the boardroom, might be uh, an interview, final interview, might be a, you know, a race or, or anything that you're kind of going through. And, uh, you know, it means that you have got the skills or um, ability to, to get yourself to that position, right? So it probably means that something good is around the corner, as long as you can kind of hold tight and, and kind of get through it. So, uh, no, I like, I like that kind of thought process. Um, I suppose there are certain times um, where, yeah, to get out of that position is to discuss our accomplishments or maybe, you know, harness um, confident humility. Um, how can we do this in, a, in an effective way that doesn't maybe feel unnatural or kind of scary, I guess? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question and something that, that I've worked with, which I also think is super important. It's, you know, building that self-awareness and really try to understand yourself um, and spending some some time on it. So, uh, so you know, so you don't have to always ask other people for acknowledging you. You kind of really need to build up yourself. Um, but it also comes with a certain level of trust. So uh, uh, that's particularly with the people around you, right? So, uh, so can you can you say uh, can you be humble and say, you know, I don't know this. Uh, while you can also talk about th that what you can do and what you are capable in without it being you know um, seen as you know bragging or self elevating, um, but so yeah so you need um, you need the organization um, to support that people particularly if you're in a leadership position right to not expect people or leaders to have the right answer all the time but trust them to be capable anyways um, I think that's the best foundation for for you to kind of also build up that confident humility and be like, oh, right, okay, this is not a place where I need to know everything straight out the bat. It's good enough to know that I'm, I'm a capable person. And then I can, uh, and then I can go into conversations saying, okay, I, I don't know if this is a true answer, but here's something, and then let's work off of that. Um, so, and but you also need to bring that to the table. So you need to kind of bring that to the people around you in the same way, right? If you expect them to kind of to deliver that trusting space to you, you need to create that for other people as well. So it's a, it's a give and take, uh, but I think definitely that that self-awareness, and I don't think bragging is going to be sort of a, a major thing if you, if you do have imposter syndrome, right? Then, you know, it's, it's, I don't really think it's, it's, a, it's in the nature, uh, but you need to showcase your, your work, right? It's for your own sake um, and for everybody else's sake, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think there's probably times um, in your career when, you know, self-promotion is probably necessary, right? Absolutely. When have you faced that? Um, what kind of times have you had to almost promote yourself or your work? Yeah. And I think uh, that is that is definitely, you know, every time you have to um, to to go for a, go for a race, uh, you know, or go for a promotion. And, uh, you know, we need to um, you need to to take that on. Also, when you are when you are doing your work, right, particularly as a consultant, but also as a leader in any way, you need to make people confident, make them believe that you know what you're doing, right. So you you can't you can't go in and and just say, oh, I, I can't, you know, I can't do anything, and then you know let people figure out that you can, because that's you know that's not a way to build up um, confidence in the people around you that you are. That, that you can solve a problem. So particularly as a consultant, right, you need to go and, and basically convince your customers that you can solve that problem. And the same for when you're hired for a, for a job in, in, in any organization, right, they hire you to solve specific things. And you need to, you need to also say, without it being bragging, that you, uh, that you are capable um, and that you do know what you're doing. So you need to sprinkle, sprinkle in some self-promotion to get to where you want to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think you're right. What you said at the beginning is that it's not uh, exclusive just to women, that that thought or that feeling, but it is definitely common in, in women, right? I think oftentimes the people who are vulnerable to imposter syndrome are probably the type of people who are also saying yes to every task and yes to every you know job or yeah, I can take care of that. I'll do that. I'll do that. So in the back of your mind, you kind of know I am capable because I'm, I'm willing to take on the extra assignment or risk or pick up that slack from that person or whatever it might be but then when it comes to asking for the raise you almost forget like that you did all of that stuff and it's like oh actually you know maybe I'm not good enough so yeah it's probably taking a bit of stock around like 
you can do all of that because you often take charge of it in the background but now you need to make everyone aware that you you did that and you know you can push yourself yeah I think there's absolutely something in that also I think women has taken on more of these supporting roles sort of historically right where where we're not the ones who, who have been you know at the forefront of everything and we can be and we should be uh, but it also comes with the ability to say what we actually achieved right so there's an evolution that we're that I think we're going through um, and that we need to kind of help each other I think we as women also need to elevate uh, each other right in in that sense um, and I think if I can take that back to a little bit of the of the bragging piece right I think we we need to not look at each other as bragging but actually saying okay you you said something about what you achieved and I'll celebrate you for that instead of you know saying okay you know calm down um and uh, you know help lift each other up in that sense that kind of plays in nicely with um self-image right and and as women you know we oftentimes do have a self-image that we may or may not always live up to but I think if we think about our past versus our present, you know, how do you feel like self-image plays a role in, in I guess, levels of confidence or imposter syndrome? Mm. Um, I think uh, there's definitely, uh, you know, your self-image doesn't necessarily change a lot over time. It might evolve. But I think for me, uh, I definitely had the whole shy kid and not a creative kid, that that was sort of how I saw myself. I actually also for a long time thought I was introvert, which I'm not at all. I'm super extrovert, but because I was shy, I didn't, you know, I didn't know the difference between being extroverted and being shy. Um, and and then that sort of not being creative because I wasn't the one who knew how to draw or how to sew. Um, but but maybe I was creative in other ways, but I, I couldn't see that, right? Um, so you, know, you, you have a self-image you carry with you and, you know, it, it can... It can impact some of your decisions, but I think mostly for me, you also see how it evolves over time with experience that your your self image and who you are in a workplace can actually be two, uh, you know, slightly different things because you build up professional skills. For example, we talk a lot about professional extroverts who are actually introverts, but, you know, in a professional context, they learn how to be extroverts because they need to be. And I think I learned a lot about being a creative, uh, particularly. I thought I was not a creative kid. It was like, oh, but that's also something about how you set that up, how you manage creativity um, and how that becomes a, um, a process. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, you, can, you can use it to really improve yourself and be like, where are there some areas that I want to work with? But you can also say, well, this is my self-image and maybe I can evolve that over time by learning some some personal professional skills uh, that helps you uh, helps you uh, evolve that and you can start sort of build belief in your abilities that more positively impacts your self image rather than sort of uh, you know only focusing on the on the downsides i think a self image is also an opportunity to improve and back to the whole self awareness so if you try to see like what is it how am i actually talking about myself internally okay maybe that's not a that's not a good way maybe that's something i should improve on and how can I do that how can I throw myself out in situations at work where I challenge that belief about myself or do that in personal settings I, I do it in both work-wise and personally and be like oh um, I'm scared of something no you know what I hate being scared of something I will just go do it um, and then we'll can see afterwards whether I was scared of it or not um, to, to kind of push yourself um, so yeah it, it, I think it definitely does play a role yeah, absolutely. And I guess, as you mentioned, that like kind of pushing yourself maybe out of your comfort zone or almost telling yourself, I guess, within reason, right? Like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make it work um, is a way that we can actively change or um, flex uh, certain aspects of our personality type in different scenarios. I think that's probably pretty important from your experience, right? Working in consulting, and uh, we'll touch on that in a minute, but, you know, working in probably fast paced high growth companies where you know one one day to the next it's always different so you know one day you might have to be that kind of emotionally supportive team manager if the team is going through something the next day you might have to be extremely process driven and you know target oriented and then the next it might, it might be about celebrating success and you know kind of being that fun extrovert wh whatever it might look like and understanding how your personality is for yourself 
and then what kind of situations you have to flex that style right I think as you mentioned that that's probably an important skill to to harness over time with experience yeah absolutely and uh, and I think the more about you know the more you know about yourself and the team around you you you're better at knowing you know analyzing the context and saying okay well in this situation I should probably not lean towards my nature which is to just like kind of go for it and you know eyes on the ball uh, let's just solve this problem maybe this is this is the time to focus more on the team and the feelings and the emotional side of things and the more experience you get I think you should say the better you are at flexing and knowing what your what your blind spots uh, may be but also, I think the next level of that is surrounding you with people that fill in the gaps that you might have, right? That's the, that's when you really sort of start to, to level up. That is to say, you know, this is this is something that I that is an actual gap for me. And for me to move ahead, I need to make sure that I have somebody to help me close close that gap, or or at least make me aware of it if I'm ignoring it. So I think that's that's super important as you kind of as you go up. And that's something that I've spoken to my to my leaders about in my career and how they try to how do they try to do that. Fantastic. Cool. I really like that. Um, so yeah, maybe touching on um, what we could maybe call portfolio career experience. Um, so you've obviously worked in lots of different verticals, different types of teams and functions, in different industries. How how has that positively impacted your skill set? I think it's very much a positive impact. I think, first of all, I'm just super lucky to have been in the job that I have. Okay, I need to remember to give myself credit for also going there. But that said, I think I've been super, super lucky, uh, right? Or I consider myself lucky at least. And I think the variety of my career choices has given me a really broad skill set, which also suits my preferred career style. So, you know, there are, there are different career styles and then very much the sort of episodic expanding where I do different things to try to always build uh, sort of in contrast to the to the expert style that just kind of really goes down into into a certain area um, and it's just a different different preferred style but but with this preferred style then you know having that career of different um, verticals teams functions etc right has, has been really really good for me I think first off starting in consulting really gave me that you know strong consulting toolbox a generalist um, foundation that could kind of take me then where I wanted to go afterwards gave me knowledge about a lot of different companies and industries and skills within, you know, IT, IT management and organizational development and stakeholder management, project management, um, really sort of really, really good foundation to kind of go anywhere from. And I think that's also what we see that consultants have a tendency to, to go many, many different places after, after they've been in consulting, unless they stay, of course, in consulting. It, it gave me the the opportunity to go kind of, you know, back to product development by joining, you know, SaaS companies, startups, and, but work with strategy and, and finally also leadership, right? So it gave me a really good starting off point for going, going to SaaS companies. And, and I think, you know, in those startup SaaS companies, I've learned so much about, you know, from strategy to development, right down to coding, but also actually something that was quite new for me was the whole sales and customer success perspective, uh, which has been an immense learning journey for me because that's not something that comes from sort of my engineering background and that's something I was close to in the, in consulting either. So in really getting into that sort of commer- how the commercial operations of a business work and, you know, understanding revenue operations, all this stuff is sort of really, uh, really an eye-opener. And something that I wouldn't have gotten if I hadn't really gone to a small startup where I was right next to sales and CS and had to work with strategy and leadership and kind of how would that work as well. Yeah, so sort of develop my skills uh, both towards the detailed level with, you know, product software development and then upwards and holistically uh, sort of company-wide strategy and organization um, and really working on, on all levels. So I think it's, you know, it's broadened my interpersonal skills as well and stakeholder management. I think I can work with most people in most team constructions, at least that's, I convinced myself that that's true. And I think it also is, you know, because I understand the work that goes on for different people, you know, at least superficially, and that I understand sort of their place in the organization and can therefore sort of appreciate, you know, anybody's point of view, um, which I think, you know, it's definitely also improved my decision-making skills because the more I understand about the different parts of the business, uh, the better decisions I believe that I can that I can make in so yeah you know you can probably also hear I'm super motivated by sort of the changes and the and the possibilities and you know picking up all these skills and strategy and organizational development and product development and leadership sort of it 
it gives me so many more potential areas to go to is uh, sort of in the future as well and so yeah it's i think it's an exciting sort of i think i've been through an exciting journey um, and i think it really has given me a really really broad skill set uh, yeah gives me the ability to continue on that on that journey if that makes sense totally and yeah i can tell just by by talking to you that it's uh, definitely giving you the energy and excitement to pursue yeah lots of different avenues and you probably you know have picked up al- along the way a lot of confidence just by being in so many different scenarios and under- and like just being unfamiliar at the beginning and being like okay i don't know what i'm doing i'm going to learn this and be successful in whatever that kind of arena was and then go into another situation okay I don't know what I'm doing I'll learn it and then roll it out and then again and then by the time you get to like the 10th I'm like okay I'm in another room where I don't know what's going on but I'm confident that I will learn it and figure it out and that probably is um, quite helpful in that toolbox as well right just the general kind of yeah going back to your your self-awareness and, and confidence and preparing and things like that so really powerful to have that kind of breadth of experience which yeah I'm sure will be very helpful down the road so in terms of like any tactics um, that women could you know use think about or build in their success stories anything tangible that you have that would help yeah yeah I think so Um, I think it starts with actually you know writing stuff down Um, when you do have when you do succeed with something uh, write it down uh, whether it's a journal or sort of a bullet on a post-it, a post-it note I'm very much a post-it uh, wall kind of uh, person if you haven't figured that one out already um, or sort of your own little mind mapping session on the wall sort of you know practice looking at yourself and finding those accomplishments and then writing them down and maybe that will feel really weird, you know, having to write down that accomplishment. But if you can't write it down, you definitely can't say it, right? So, so it starts, I think it really starts there. And I think another thing that's been really important to me uh, was uh, around compliments. And where I've had a tendency to really shy away from compliments and be like, oh, no, uh, no, I, I, you know, that's not true. Or it wasn't just me. Or, you know, uh, don't give this to me. It's, uh, it, it, I, I, I can't take it on. But, but it's really a gift that somebody else gives to you. So to so take the compliment, maybe even actually write it down physically or, or, or mentally, make a men- mental note of it and be like, okay, somebody told me this, you know, instead of saying that's not true, maybe I should just write it down and be like, okay, maybe it is true. And then at one point, you know, you might be able to, to believe that about yourself. And then, you know, back to the accomplishments, if you, if you really do struggle to identify them, if you're standing there and you're sitting with your journal, not being able to write anything down, not writing anything in those post-it notes, then ask people you trust, right? Uh, you know, ask them if it's a leader or your friends or whoever it is, ask them how they see you and how they see your successes. I think, you know, that outside in perspective is, is really important. So if you don't have anybody who tells you this on a daily basis, well, then go and ask. Um, find that safe space and and get that input I think that's that's super important I really like that one um making sure that you have people in your network that you can kind of reach out to when you almost need a little bit of a pick-me-up right yeah yeah exactly um and then I think finally you know it it comes with with reflection and that whole self-awareness right so as people that's always a good thing but practice that reflection um I think I try to make time for you know, sitting down 30 minutes and then just reflect on what went well, what didn't go so well. That's also an important part of, you know, building yourself up is saying, okay, well, this is, this is not something I'm great at, but I can probably learn. And then I can start working with my imposter syndrome. And I'll be the first to admit that, you know, I don't always get that time put aside for reflection, but when I do, it is so powerful um, to really kind of look at yourself and, and and give yourself those opportunities to kind of improve on on you and 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 build yourself up and really work through those yeah those imposter syndrome moments that you that you might have yeah definitely I think probably everyone is victim to not allotting enough time for that right and it actually every time I kind of do it same like maybe 30 minutes or so you know set some time aside to yourself have a nice coffee and go through and then you're like oh I should do this more often it was really powerful experience 
and then we kind of push it to the wayside but yeah it is obviously um a really good six you know ability to build your confidence by writing down it. i'm totally an advocate for that i think even you know doing things like updating your linkedin and physically forcing yourself to think about what did i do in in that role and what did i achieve and when you're writing it you know you're like oh that was pretty good <laughs> uh, you know my time there was actually decent oh i did have career progression i did deliver on you know whatever that um revenue target was or that program etc so yeah similarly to writing a journal it's it's quite a, a nice way to reflect and uh... yeah i think that's a really good idea because it, it's also also helpful for you to always have an updated resume right so if you kind of make it part of your regular practice then you actually also always have an updated resume and you know it's that's always good to have and it's all, always helpful and you know even if you don't use it to go for another job you can use it for your uh, promotion negotiations for salary you know all that stuff exactly absolutely no i think that's it's a really good point um and in terms of like your part of that building your success stories i guess it's about defining like what's really important to you um and your values how did you kind of start going about defining your values because it can maybe um maybe seem overwhelming to people but also might seem quite simple like I obviously know my values but then I think if people are put on the spot to really talk them through then they might realize actually it's a bit more of a complex thought process so have you got any you know kind of top tips for someone who's starting to um really consider their values and, and how did you go about defining those for yourself mm -hmm. yeah and I think you know values are so important I don't I think I under underestimated the value of values until until I actually uh, started develop them, developing them again it was with a coach they were actually you know the process of starting to work with them is easy you know really uh, nailing them down is the hard part uh, but basically what I did was uh, to go through a list of you know all things that are that are values you can find these lists online basically say you know core values give me a long list and then through different iterations you mark down the ones that are most important to you maybe you start out by noting down 15 or 10 and then you slowly narrow down that list if you always have to sort something out you know what would you then sort out and then you come closer to a list and, and maybe you have to work with a list of three or five and then feel them out so I'm doing that now, right? I, I have my set of core values and, I, and, and some of them are, you know, very, very strong for me. I can use them every, every day for uh, decision making and really being that compass for me. And then there is, you know, one or two, I'm like, I'm feeling it out. I'm like, okay, this, this actually helped me. Is this actually a core value for me? Or when it comes to, comes down to it, do I use something else to, to be my compass? So always test them out and, and try them try them out. Um, they have to be a little bit aspirational. I think if, if they're easy for you, then you know are they really are they really those core values or is it just kind of behaviors, right? So for me, they're they're a little aspirational. It's not always easy, uh, but when I look at them, I'm like okay, well this will actually help me to make a decision um, or do something in a specific way. So yeah, working with core values is you know really important to me and I really hope more people will uh, will do it if they if they aren't yeah, already absolutely I love that and I think you know we're often taught in school or um, maybe at home or you know growing up that you know these are these are good values like xyz and you know oftentimes we're like okay cool those are my values I'll just go through life with those as as my values but as we get older and you think you know in different work scenarios and different parts of your career you probably have pivot points where you maybe really define those in, in a stronger way and, and actually everyone is different right and everyone has different long-term goals or aspirations and you know it's probably going through that exercise is probably quite good because it helps you define what's actually important to you rather than perhaps what you've been told on TV or um, by your family growing up or your, you know, home life or, or whatever it might be. And actually all of a sudden, you know, it helps be kind of, you become a bit more genuine uh, to yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's, that's what it feels like for me. I think one of them, I can, I can, I can say that out loud confidently, right. Which is courage. And I think that actually very much, 
kind of is reflected in my career choices and, and who I am as a, as a person. And it really does help me when there's something I'm in doubt about, like, okay, courage. So what does courage tell me to do, right? Uh, how do I use that to make a decision? Um, and I can just really feel it um, all the way down to, to my core. So it, it is just really, it's a good way for you to also talk positively about yourself, I think, to some degree, right? Um, to kind of say, well, these are, these are my values. This is what I believe in. And, you know, like, okay, but, you know, it's good. I understand who I am and what, what's important to me some part of who you are right Mel is not going to solve all the problems in the world um, but I think I just thought of another way to kind of get started with values but the thing that I did specifically which was to look at other people you know people that I consider you know either successful or good people and be like what is it in them that makes me think that they are good people um, or that makes me excited about them and be like, okay, well, what is it that I see? And then that can can kind of help you guide, uh, narrow down your list of, of, uh, of potential core values. Yeah, I like that. I like that tip. Okay, cool. Well, that kind of wraps it up there, um, Emily. Loved the conversation today. I think I've uh, taken some tips myself that I will try to enact for sure. And I'm, I think everyone listening will also um, do the same. But I'll leave you with the last question. So where is next on your vacation bucket list? Oh, good question. So, uh, so the bucket list item is for sure actually a trip around Nepal, some hiking in the uh, in the Himalayas. Uh, something that's that's an exciting journey that I would like to to take on. Um, so it has, it isn't booked yet. I'm sorry to say, but it will be soon. Oh, amazing! I mean, that's definitely uh, on my list as well. I'd love to do that. I guess the courage uh, part comes into play there as well, right? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> See, guys, just worth work and personal life, right? That's the important part. Amazing. Well, that sounds fantastic. And I would love to see some pictures after that. So, yeah, we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed today's conversation. And um, we will speak again soon. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Emily.